All right, so good afternoon. And thank you all for joining us. This is the first student leadership series event of our new year. And on your screen, you will see um, some general information about the student leadership series and today's event, as well as a couple of spotlights of our fantastic faculty members um, that we have. Uh, you will be hearing more from these individuals today in the session. For the students who are new to the student leadership series, this is a monthly series that we uh, host here at the college or here in the business and accounting division. And the goal of the series is to highlight our programs and give you an opportunity to talk with and learn from professionals in the program. So each month we spotlight a, a different program and um, we spotlight the faculty as well as the professionals or industry professionals. Today, we have a fantastic treat in ahead of us. Uh, we will be get we will get to hear from our office administration, medical office administration, and our billing and coding team. In addition, we will hear from Christy Kurtz, who is with Career Services. With that, I would like to welcome you again. I am Marsha Colson, the associate dean of the division, and I uh, would like to turn this, the spotlight over to Dr. Marilyn Martin, who is the program chair for office administration. Medical Office Administration and Medical Billing and Coding. Welcome, Dr. Martin, and welcome students and faculty. Thank you, Ms. Colson, for that warm welcome, and uh, welcome everyone who is on uh, the WebEx this afternoon. Thank you for allowing us to host the first um, student leadership series of the semester. We are glad to do it. So I'm going to share my screen, and we'll get started. Can you all hear me okay? Can you? Yes, thank you, John, Dr. Allison. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, as um, Ms. Colson mentioned, my name is uh, Marilyn Martin. I am the chair for Medical Office Administration, Medical Billing and Coding, and Office Administration. And we will share a little bit about our program this afternoon. Um, as well, well as uh, hear from um, a few of our students who have matriculated through our programs and have started their careers. Um, we are going to start off with some official introductions of our faculty here, and we will start with um, Ms. Faye Harvin, Ms. Harvin. Good afternoon, everyone. I have been at the for two months. 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 I have been uh, if you can let Cynthia introduce herself, I will try to switch machines and come back. Okay. Ms. Brunson. Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Brunson. I too am having a few uh, technical challenges. <laughs> My computer is running really slow to get caught up, but I am working from the mobile device. Um, Cynthia Brunson, I've been in this department since uh, full time since 2008. Um, I came from the industry uh, where I worked as a business systems analyst in uh, retail for belt store services. And I also uh, then I started teaching part time here at CP for the corporate and continuing education. Uh, teaching computer software courses, and then I migrated over to pathways to employment. And that's where I met um, our founder, Ms. Dora Johnson, and got into the office administration department full time. I'm a graduate of East Carolina University with a bachelor's in business education um, and a master's in strategic leadership from the University of Charleston. I primarily teach the computer courses, um, the keyboarding, um, 
10 key skills or um, presentations and QuickBooks and other things of that sort. My esteem. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brunson. Ms. Harvin, are you, can we go back to you? Sure, you can. Can you hear me now? Can you hear Much you better? better. Okay. Hold Good on. afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for uh, allowing us to uh, introduce our program. Uh, I'll wait for uh, Dr. Martin to move back to my slide. Yes. And I will tell you a little bit about, about me. While she's doing that, I've been at Central Piedmont for about 22 years. Uh, it was such a pleasure uh, to work in the Pathways to Employment uh, program. That's where I started here at CP uh, and did that for about 13 years before I moved over full time. Uh, my uh, courses that I teach are mostly technology courses. Uh, before I came to Central Piedmont, I uh, was working as an educational consultant at uh, First Union, which is now Wells Fargo. Uh, since I have been at Central Piedmont, I've had several opportunities uh, where I've taught at Queens University, uh, the Urban League of Central Carolinas, and I have taught lots of senior citizens at the Charlotte Housing Authority. Uh, I, my bachelor's degree is from Delaware State University, and I also received my master's certificate in community college teaching. So again, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for giving us this time. Thank you, Ms. Harvin. So I will briefly introduce myself. Um, I um, have been a full-time instructor at the college since 2019, the fall of 2019. Prior to that, um, I was an adjunct instructor um, at York Technical College, uh, Virginia College, Rowan Cabarrus Community College, as well as California Intercontinental University. Um, I, a couple of the places that I've worked in industry, which has been primarily healthcare, um, Nixon Pruitt, working with a healthcare attorney as a consultant and auditor, um, Piedmont Medical Center, where I was an inpatient practice manager. Um, Palmetto Health and Atrium Health, where I was a manager in their business offices, overseeing billing and claims operations, and then Charlotte Eye, Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates, where I was a medical secretary and assisted um, in the area of research. I earned my BS degree from Winthrop University um, with a concentration in health administration, then continued to get my master's of business administration, also from Winthrop University, and then uh, completed by Doctor of Business Administration and Leadership from Walden University, um, which is an, a completely online university. Um, and then here are the, the courses that I serve as lead instructor for, which are all of our MOA courses. And we'll talk about a little bit about the content in the next slide. So in our department, you have several options. You could either pursue your associate's degree or you could uh, pursue a certificate or you can do both. Many of our students uh, leave uh, Central Piedmont with, with multiple credentials. So you can uh, pursue an, an associate of applied science and office administration, an associate of applied science and medical office administration, or an Associate of Applied Science and Medical Office Administration with a concentration in medical billing and coding. Um, both of our programs, uh, Office Administration and Medical Office Administration offers two certificate options. For Office Administration, you can earn a specialization in receptionist skills, or you can become an Office Administration Specialist. And for Medical Office Administration, you can earn a certificate in medical office administration, which primarily focuses on administrative um, duties in healthcare or procedural and diagnostic coding. Um, as most um, other programs where you have certificates and associate degrees, um, there is a lot of overlap between our uh, certificates and associate degree programs. However, uh, we have recently made some changes where our certificates are now, are now stackable. So um, you, you're looking at taking different courses and gaining some different skill sets by um, uh, pursuing each of the, the different certificates. 
So what are we covering in our classes? Um, Ms. Brunson and Ms. Harvin just mentioned that they um, focus on technology, the Microsoft Office applications, which includes Word, PowerPoint, Access, and Excel. Um, several of our classes um, actually kind of um, focuses on one or the other. So you are learning more advanced skills um, and how to navigate those applications. Um, and then on the MOA side, you are learning um, we have a course that actually simulates working in a medical office where you're actually checking in patients, logging into an EHR, scheduling appointments. Um, we have a course that also uh, introduces you to how to do medical billing that covers concepts like medical insurance, um, the difference between a HICFA claim and um, a UB claim, which is for hospital billing, um, as well as things like uh, self-pay and collections as well. And then, of course, we have um, four coding courses that teaches you how to um, code um, diagnoses as well as procedures. And uh, it also includes a, a course where you are prepared to earn your CPC certification, that's Certified Professional Coder Certification, which is a certification um, that is overseen by the American Academy of Professional Coders. And then our last coding class is OSC 250, where students can actually learn about long-term care coding, which is a particular type or specialty in medical coding. So students in our uh, area um, can learn all of these skills or pick and choose. And Ms. Harvin or Ms. Brunson, if you want to add more to um, what we offer on the um, applications and technology side, I will defer to one or both of you. All right, we'll keep moving. Are there any questions before we continue the presentation? And I cannot see hands. Um, so you'll have to take yourself off mute if you have a question. Okay, we'll keep going. So what are your plans for the future? So here are a couple of um, position titles that um, some of our graduates have found themselves in. They range from administrative assistant to front office supervisor to billing and coding specialist, patient account representative, or physician practice coordinator. And again, uh, the skills that they learn in the courses that we offer here uh, uniquely prepare them for each of these roles. And I'm not sure if Nichelle is here yet, but I do know that um, Ms. Lou Banks is on the call. So what I would like to do, what we would like to do is we have a couple of graduates in our program that we would like to spotlight. Um, they are willing to come back and kind of share about their experience in our programs. And at this time, Ms. Lou Banks, are you at a place where you can speak? Yes, I am. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining okay. us. Thank you. Um, I'm Lou Banks. I've always wanted to do something in the medical field, but when I came to CPCC and I met Ms. Harvin and Ms. Bronson, they kind of helped me decide that that's where I needed to be. Um, they also gave, you know, they helped me with being ready for the interview. They helped me with, you know, presentations, everything. Um, I learned so much. I, I, the courses were, I, I'm an older learner, so it's different for me than someone who's coming straight out of high school. So I had already been in a career for 10 years that was, that I had to leave, that I left. So coming here was important for me and they kept me motivated. But the one thing that I liked the most was that I learned that when I go into a job that you can never say what you won't do because my first job was not the first job I wanted, but I went to the emergency room at Maine. That was my very first medical job because I came from banking, but 
I never said what I wouldn't do. I, I tell people you have to work where you are. People, when you think that the managers and the supervisors aren't watching, they are. Because I started at Maine. I learned to work at South Park, which is totally different. From there, I went to learn how to schedule. And now that I learned how to schedule for doctor's offices, then I moved to scheduling for specialty. And I'm currently in patient financial services in the um, correspondence department where I Q&A insurance refund. But that's not going to be my final stop because my degree is in billing and coding. But this was a way for me to get what I learned from being SCP was financial patient financial services department I'm in now is connected with billing and coding. So if I start here, then I can prove myself here. I can move to another spot. That's the things that I learned is that whatever you have to do to get where you want to go, that's what you have to do. And Ms. Harvin and all of the faculty that I came in contact with was always willing to help. You try to go that extra mile. If you wanted them to look at something to see, you know, mock interviews, I mean, everything that I needed to keep my career moving, they gave me. I have a friend who's in the program right now that I used to work with at, at my job before I came here. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, um, Lou, for taking the time out of your work day to join us. We appreciate you sharing a little bit about your experience um, here in the program and for sharing you know, how your credentials have served you as you started your new career in healthcare. Um, I do want to take a few minutes uh, to, to speak to some of the things that Ms. Banks mentioned about um, how she decided to take um, the job that was offered to her um, because it is a segue into the career that she wants, which is in billing and coding. And so um, oftentimes uh, when I'm advising particularly particularly medical office administration students, I do share that that is the best route to take. You know, yes, we want to, most of them come in wanting to work from home. That is a desire of those who are going into the coding industry. And while it is a primarily remote industry, um, I will, I do like to be honest with people to say, typically that comes um, as a benefit to those who are more seasoned and who have worked in an office, um, a business office, a HIM office, and so um, she also, uh, I also mentioned, talked about certification um, a couple of slides back. And so one of the certifications, again, that our um, OST 249 course prepares students for is the Central uh, Certified Billing and Coding, I'm sorry, the CPC, the Certified Professional Coder certifi Certification, which we are hoping to be able uh, to offer to our students in-house before they graduate. And so that certification is separate and uh, unique from our programs, um, but it does set the bar and shows um, those who are in healthcare that you have taken the time to actually learn the skill of coding and that you can apply it. So jobs would, are definitely um, going to be forthcoming to those who put in the work and to get the certifications. And on the same side of that, um, we offer, um, we want to start offering um, certification in medical um, office specialists um, for our health, I'm sorry, our Microsoft office classes. And so Ms. Brunson or Ms. Harvin, if you wanted to kind of go back and talk about um, those that we're hoping to feature in our program next year. Uh, I've been covering, covering what we call our weapons class because that uh, is an acronym for all of the applications in the Microsoft Office suite. So I always tell students, you, you're not getting a gun, but you do need a weapon to be ready. So it's Word, Excel, Access, PowerPoint. Uh, we've done some Outlook. And then we go out to the, the web and uh, do some Google Drive type things. So uh, we try to give them a good experience of using the application standalone 
But then when we introduce them to uh, the applications of the Google Drive, we show them how to integrate things and how to work on a computer if you don't have those applications uh, of the Microsoft Office Suite. So we're hoping to get uh, certified uh, so that they can have, um, so that they can tell people I am uh, good in all of these, these different areas. So uh, we're using the most recent, recent version of the Office Suite and our students are coming back and saying they're learning quite a bit. Uh, we're also showing them how to use other applications that are related to uh, Word, Excel, Access, and PowerPoint. It's good to have those in your toolbox, but when you can go and say things like, I know how to use Prezi, which is a presentation application, uh, that gives them the opportunity to wow an employer. So uh, we're giving them as much as we can. Uh, as we learn, you know, uh, I have connected them with uh, LinkedIn Learning, which has a plethora of all types of training. But the, the great thing about that is, say they get a job that's not using the latest version, they can go to LinkedIn Learning and go to an earlier version so that they can relate to what they're actually using. Uh, the nice thing about that training is they can get a certificate Employers can see that they're being proactive and staying abreast with the latest technology. So we try to give them, uh, I load up the gun, you know, I try to give them exactly what they need so that when they do go out, that they're actually ready. Thank you. Thank just you. To tack on, just to add on to that, we are also using, um, implementing in our classrooms, the G metrics software that helps them prepare for the certification exam for the software. Um, certifications. So uh, hopefully we will have more students going through that, taking the practice test, really preparing themselves to sit for the certifications uh, so that they can add those things to their resume. Thank you both Ms. Harvin and Ms. Ms. Bronson. And I believe uh, we had another student who wanted to share. Uh, I'm not sure if she's joined yet. So uh, until such time that she does, um, we will move on and entertain any general questions that you have about our programs, our courses. And again, I cannot see hands. Let me just stop sharing so I can see. Dr. Martin? Yes, Dr. Gaming. I can ask one of your students a question uh, and this is in regard to the the actual job. I mean, I kind of know building and coding, but is that dealing mostly with uh, the customers, the the patients billing, or the insurance companies? So, is um, Ms. Banks, would you like to answer that question? Yes, I will answer that. That's more dealing with the doctors and the insurance company. Because what we do is we read the note of the doctor and look for a diagnosis to be able to code. So, thank you, Ms. Banks. So, to give you all perspective, our uh, coders, so billing and coding is not the same. That's one of the first things I try to tell my students. Um, I do call them first cousins um, because in order to get to the point where your, your claim is billed out, it has to be coded by a, a, a coder. And so what a medical coder actually does um, by, by design of their position is they are assigned to read the documentation that your provider um, actually um, creates during your visit. So all of us have been patients at some point. Um, now everything is electronic. They all have EHRs or electronic health records. So you will see your doctor or the nurse before him or her um, coming in and typing in the EHR. After that visit is over, um, back in the business office somewhere or, or health, health information management department, there is a coder a couple of days out that will look at everything your provider typed about your visit. And it covers your medical history. It covers the actual exam that they do on you, whether they check your neurology system, your respiratory system, your car, all of the exam elements, as well as the assessment and plan. So that is what they decide needs to be done to treat whatever ailment you have. And so as coders, we go and look through all of that stuff and we use our big coding books. And I think mine are at home. 
um, to determine the best procedure code that outlines that or that um, corresponds with the service that your provider provided to you. So we have to choose a procedure code and we also have to choose a diagnosis code, which is the actual condition condition that they diagnose you with. Um, so, and part of that is also, again, your past medical history. So, if you have a chronic condition, that is also considered when we're choosing um, our procedures and our codes, because that can further complicate the current acute condition that you have. So, it is a process of literally going through medical records, which are now electronic records, and determining which code is best to be put on the claim. Now, I will say that most coders also use electronic stuff. We call it um, CAC, Computer Assistant Coding, and CAC is the acronym. So most coders do not have to use these big heavy books that they have to use in, for, in class, but you have to learn by using the books before you can have confidence selecting the right code with the comp computer. So everything is, the technology is everywhere in healthcare. It's not just, you know, the robots and the x-rays and all of that good stuff. It also impacts our administrative side, but at the end of the day, you have to know the concepts, the guidelines behind assigning these diagnoses and procedural codes in order to get the billing piece of it right. And billing is the part where the claim goes to United Healthcare, they review it, process it, and say, yes, I'm gonna pay you, or no, I'm not gonna pay you, which is considered a denial, and here's why I'm not gonna pay you. And so what your business offices, hospitals, your physician business offices, you have patient account representatives. Um, they're looking at these claims, these denials to figure out why they didn't get paid and what needs to be done to overturn the denial and get the payment. So that is a, a, the, the, probably the shortest description of the revenue cycle, if you will, and how it starts with patient reception. You've been checked in and checked out. Um, which is where our MOA people are primarily, they'll start off at front desk or, you know, check it, check in, check out, or um, insurance verification, those more administrative roles. But if for students who are in our coding program, it is very technical, it is very analytical. It's almost like putting a puzzle together is the way I describe it to our students. Um, you can't just go with the first code that you see. You literally sometimes have to read through pages to make sure that the guidelines match up to the documentation that you're actually reviewing. So it's a pretty tedious task and most coding jobs are on production. So when I was a coder, um, I worked from, worked from home for about four years. I, there were a certain number of charts I had to complete every hour. And then of course there was also a quality aspect to it. So the charts were audited and I had a QA, um, had to have a QA error rate, I think of 3% or less. So it is a very technical job. Um, it does pay well, but it is, it is um, there are just a couple of skill sets you probably wanna have before you jump into that pool. Does that answer your question? Probably over answers your question, Dr. Gammon, but I wanted to give people, um, when you asked that question, I thought, hmm, probably should explain the difference because there is insurance, like life insurance and and you know property and casualty insurance and then there's health insurance and another thing that i will just clear up since we have the floor is sometimes people hear the term coding i've actually gotten calls um they're interested in learning how to code but they're not talking about medical coding they're talking about software coding so i need to direct them to someone on the fifth floor they're talking about um pro computer programming so you can use the you can hear these terms and if you're not sure what they are, you probably should ask some questions, but medical coding and computer coding are two different things. So they're not even remotely possible. And I've actually dabbled in that as well, um, but they are not the same. So I did want to clear that up in case someone heard the term coding. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry, does anyone else have a question? I did not mean to hoard. I have a question, Dr. Martin. Yes. So as we have quite a few first year students, um, many first year students or many students in general are interested in going into the medical field, but they also have an interest in business. They like numbers, they like people, they like things, business. And based on what you shared with us today, 
it sounds as if medical office administration and medical billing and coding would be a good combination of the two. So can you share if, um, if a student were interested in working in the medical field, but they were more interested in the business side and the revenue side of healthcare, would this be a good option? That that is an absolute yes. Um, that is an absolute yes. So I'm going to try to give you guys a short answer because I, as you saw earlier, all of my degrees are in business, and um, I just ended up landing in healthcare. So so there are some synergies there because, as I mentioned, most of the positions that we are grooming our students for. They are business office positions. They are customer service positions. They are um, so there is an overlap there for sure. And there are many of our students um, already leave our program with a desire to be a physician practice manager or to go into management. So there's there's a separate skill skill set there. Um, while we did just add a class in our program um, that teaches our um, students about. Uh, healthcare customer customer relations because the customer in healthcare is very unique and different than say a customer at McDonald's. Um, we're teaching them about soft skills and communicating with patients and things of that nature, but there is absolutely overlap. I think if students understand the the um, overall foundation of that healthcare is a business, it's it's an industry, it's a business industry. It just has its own unique parameters and those are the things that our programs try to hone in on. So I think that the two areas are very complementary, quite honestly. Um and I absolutely agree that there could certainly be um a double interest in both areas. You don't it, it doesn't have to be a either or it can be a both and yes. And um uh, Ms. Colson if you don't mind our other student just showed up so I'm going to go back to her slide if you don't mind. Hi Michelle, thank you for joining us. Oh, where she go? There she is. Hello everyone, thank you for allowing me to join. You're welcome. I'm going to pull up your slide and share my screen and then I'll let you share a little bit about your experience in our department. There you are. Hello, everyone. Again, thank you for allowing me to join. Um, I can't speak highly enough about the MOA and the OA department as a whole, an individual, uh, Mrs. Harvard, Mrs. Brunson, Dr. Martin. Um, my experience at CPCC was such an eye opener for me um, because of the different activities and groups that I was involved with. And still am not as much now, but um, service learning opened my eyes to a lot of different opportunities. Um, I was able to be involved with the Rotaract Club at the CPCC level, um, but it just reinforced for me to continue with my administration degree. Um, I have since um, was able to be involved with an internship with Novant Health in 2020, the summer of, and it has since turned into a full-time position. They loved me so much and I can't praise CPC enough. I tell them there are plenty of me out there, go look for them. <laughs> but um, I am in the diversity inclusion and equity office at Nova Health as a DNI specialist. Um, it is something that is embedded within their mission, vision and values. It's not something that it's just superficial. They really believe that it is a culture change and it is it needs to be deep within the company. So I love where I am at. Um, I do not want to leave this particular team because of what we are doing, reaching different departments and trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, um, so much so that I am going to stay within the healthcare field, but I do want to pursue a business degree because of the opportunities that I am presented with where I'm at. So those are my little pieces of CP and it will always hold a dear place for me. I don't want to leave 
but I know in order to succeed and continue to grow, I'll have to. But I am very thankful for the start that I was able to receive at PP. Thank you, Nichelle, for sharing. Um, and Nichelle, can you um, also share a little bit about your current position? Um, are you you currently working remotely? Correct. Yes. So my position started remotely um, in the summer of twenty, and there has been talks about going back, but it has remained a remote position. Um, as a matter of fact, I was able to speak to the exec executive vice president Tanya Blackman yesterday. And she mentioned that there's probably not a likelihood that everybody will be in the office um, going forward just because of what we can accomplish remotely. Although we do get together in group settings, it's just we do so well remotely, there really isn't a point in going fully um, back to um, the office. And can you share, um, you mentioned that you wanted to get your business degree. Can you share um, where you plan to pursue that? Yes, after speaking to transfer advisors at CP, um, my best option is UNC Charlotte for their business degree. So that is where I will be going. Very nice, very nice. Thank you for sharing, Michelle. Um, we, you were certainly a pleasure to have in uh, several of our programs and uh, we hated to see you go, but we know that um, that is the goal here uh, for you to come in and for us to kind of let you earn, to earn your wings and, and kind of fly. And so um, congratulations to you and to you, Ms. Banks, um, for doing so well in transitioning into your, your healthcare careers. Um, if, are there any other questions for myself, Ms. Harvin, Ms. Brunson? Before we close out this portion of the series, I just this is Sean Allison. Just a couple of things, real quick. <clears throat> First, thank you for the um, this presentation. It's been outstanding. I just want to make three quick points. Um, First, thank you for sharing the um, or allowing the former students to share. I think that personalizes this whole series and allows students to see you know there's life after school there are um, things that can be achieved so i think that was great the second thing is in reference to your uh, presenters they expressed passion for what they do which is probably somewhat of a segue to the latter part of this presentation that we all should see jobs that we are passionate about that become careers as opposed to just jobs. So it doesn't matter what, what area you're in, that's something to keep in mind. And the third thing is related to my area in the medical billing, you know, you are part of a, you're really part of a supply chain. You're part of the healthcare supply chain. You contribute in the overall health and wellness and quality of service that, you know, we all receive. And I was just making the connection with that as I listened to everyone speak and your overview of what your program or programs do. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allison, for those comments. And thank you for being here this afternoon. Are there any other? I just yes. have one one final question uh, before we transition to um, Christy. So you all talked about something that I feel is our programs, our office administration programs, uh, best kept secrets, and that is the Microsoft certification. And so my question is, is would you share with our students the value of obtaining the Microsoft certification and what they can do with that certification in industry. Like, how does that certification help them get a job and what, what jobs does it assist them in getting? Ms. Bronson, do you wanna? Okay. So just in thinking um, back when I uh, sat for my certification, um, when you list that, credential on your resume. Uh, the employer doesn't have to even think 
twice because Microsoft themselves have said, hey, this person is proficient in this particular software package. Um, so again, that's the, the whole idea of encouraging students to um, sit for the certifications so that when they're going into an employer, they don't really have to test them to see if they know how to use the various functions of Word or Excel or PowerPoint. The certification does that <laughs> and says it all in terms of, yes, I am proficient in this particular level. Um, that certification had uh, like the entry level uh, testing and, and an expert level testing. So again, I just think it just speaks to um, how fluent and how proficient they are or they feel with those particular skills. Ms. H, I don't know, you may want to add some additional to that. Yes, ditto. That's, that's all what I would have said. You know, it just shows them that they're proficient. They don't have to think about it. Uh, and uh, it helps the student to really be proud to put that down, to be able to say. So it, it kind of empowers them and they walk in with a little bit more confidence and knowing that I can say I am proficient in these skills and I do have that certification. If I could add to that, um, I recall my one up leader mentioning that during my interview process, she said what made her continue with wanting me on the team was the fact that I had mentioned I was going to through these classes, through the geometrics, trying to get those certifications because it was something that is heavily used with what I'm doing. So having the, the knowledge of how to quickly adapt to the different um, slide decks that we have to use, the Excel different files that we have to use is very key in what I'm doing. Thank you all. I, uh, I wanted to ask that question because I think that often as business students go through their programs, they learn many of these skills anecdotally. And on their resumes, they will put on there that they have these skills, but who knows what level of skills they, they are? You know, did, did you just kind of happen upon it and have to use it and you taught yourself? Having a certification does exactly what Ms. Brunson says it does it takes the question away from can you actually do this like are you just saying you can do it or can you really do it when you earn a certification there is no question and um, that that is very very strong on a resume i'm hoping maybe christy may even you know may mention it to to share with us um, her thoughts and her feelings on having that certification so thank you so much for answering that question for us you're welcome. And if there are no more questions of us, I will um, recognize uh, my colleagues in the business and accounting division, um, starting with um, Dr. Matt Njoku. He is the program chair for accounting and finance. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, Mr. Mike Greer, uh, marketing and retailing discipline chair. Thank Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Dr. Sean Allison, who has already spoken, he um, is the program chair for supply chain management. Thank you. Um, Ms. Camelia Tahiri, she is the discipline chair for global or international business. Thank you, Camelia. Dave Zeitlow, our discipline chair for human resource management. Um, Nichelle, you might want to connect with him at some point if you stay in diversity, inclusion, and equity. And um, last but certainly not least, the chair, uh, program chair for our business administration, Dr. J.B. Gammon. So, Dr. Gammon, thank you for being here this afternoon as well. Um, and Dr. Uh, Ms. Nina Neal, is she on? I don't know if she is on. I didn't get a chance to see her in the participants, but if you are here, Ms. Neal, thank you for being here. And uh, we will turn the floor back over to you, or actually to Christy Kurtz in Career Services, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. You are on mute. Okay. Sorry about that. 
Let me say what I just said. Um, I just thank you for having me today. And I just want to say that I've learned a lot um, about these programs <laughs> just in this short period of time. I thought I had it down, but I'm learning even more. Um, and also, I just really want to say to our former students, um, kudos for sharing your experiences and coming back and and letting us all know how you're doing and giving advice to upcoming students about how they can get ahead. I think it is um, truly a gift to, to be able to do that. And so um, I was just going to spend a few minutes uh, today talking a little bit about interviewing, um, but I wanted to, and as I get my screen set up, I uh, am fully aware that I am in a room full of people who are really skilled in this kind of thing. Um, so bear with me. It's been a minute since I've worked from my home office. Um, let's see here. I'm going to share this screen. Make sure everyone can see. Can I get just a quick thumbs up if you can see the slide? Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and so something that Marsha asked about with the, the certifications and how important are they to list on the resume, a thousand percent they are important to list if you have the Microsoft certifications or any other certifications. And the reason that you want to do that is because many companies are now using artificial intelligence in their applicant tracking systems or their online application systems to parse resumes or to basically read and scan them prior to them being seen by a human being. And so oftentimes those systems are set up to find and recognize those kinds of keywords. So when you have those certifications on those resumes and that matches up with the job description, you are already ahead of the game. So make sure that you are articulating that on your resume, but also make sure that you're talking about that in your interview. And so I'm gonna spend just a few moments today talking about interviewing skills. Um, because I think it's something that we could all use a little help on. I know it's not everybody's favorite topic, um, which usually means it's the topic we need to spend a little bit more time on. Um, and so this is me. I am the director of the Career Services Department here at Central Piedmont. Um, I and my team are really passionate. A few people have mentioned passions for their jobs, and I am, we are really passionate about helping our students get to where they want to be. And so um, you can find me typically the easiest way to get me is by email. Um, and so you are always, all of you are welcome to email me. If you are a student and you would like to request an appointment with one of our career counselors, we are meeting with students primarily virtually and by phone right now. Um, but we do have people on campus as well. So if you'd like to meet with a career counselor, please go to our website and fill out our form to get that process started. Um, and when you do request an appointment, just something to note, we do email students with appointment availability. So please check your email um, if, if you've sent out a request to us, because that's how we'll get back in touch, touch with you. And that's the quickest way to get something set up. But so today we're going to cover um, the four P's, I guess, of interviewing. It was not my intention for this to really kind of stick with one letter, it was that alliteration, not my, not my intent, but here we are. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how do you prepare and why it's important. We're going to talk about practicing for your interviews and some tools and resources you can use there, what a professional image is all about um, and what you should be doing post interview. And so first in talking about preparation, um, I always start my, my talks with a quote um, I happen to enjoy sports a lot. So this is a famous New York Yankees player. I just, full disclosure, I'm a Tampa Bay Rays player. So it does hurt me a little bit to, to do that. I'm joking. He's a, he was a great um, catcher. So, but Yogi Berra said, um, before you build a better mousetrap, it helps to know if there are any mice out there. And so I love this quote in terms of interviewing. Not many of us are going to be interviewing for jobs where mouse traps are literally going to be a thing. But if you think about what the employer's needs are, do they have mice? Do they have things that you need to address? We are all multi-skilled individuals who have a lot of fabulous things we can share with people, but knowing what the employer needs and what they're looking for and being able to communicate and express how you meet those needs is how you get your foot in the door. So um, that is the thing, this interview that you're going on is a chance to show the employer that you meet those needs. Um, and sometimes it's not the stuff that we're most excited about. Um, 
I share a story often of um, an, an Olympian who was interviewing or was applying for jobs and a human resources manager who recognized the person's name on, on the resume because that person had just won several gold medals in the Summer Olympic Games. And the HR manager ultimately, he and his team, they wanted to interview the person not for their skills related to the job, but just because they were starstruck and wanted to meet this Olympian. But at the end of the day, it was an engineering job. And the Olympian had basically said, I've got all this Olympic experience, but hadn't really put anything on their resume about engineering other than their college degree. And ultimately they ended up not interviewing them. Doesn't mean that person couldn't have been a great engineer. It just means you need to think about what the hiring team and what the employer is looking for. In that case, they were excited about a gold medal Olympian, but they were looking for an engineer. So think about what your audience, what your employer is looking for. And so we've already talked a little bit about some of the technical aspects behind office administration, medical office administration, some of the different technical things that you bring to the table as a professional. On the screen are some overall general things that all employers are looking for regardless. And so I always, when I'm working with students, I encourage them to take these eight career readiness competency areas. These are things that employers have said is the most important characteristics we look for in candidates when coming into the job above and beyond their technical skills. Look at these things and think about how have you demonstrated those? And don't confine yourself just to work experience. Think about how have you demonstrated that in your personal life, in your volunteer experience or your service experience? Somebody mentioned service and learning and how important and valuable that was. And that is absolutely correct. Same thing with internships. Um, and so what I would like to say is sometimes Figuring out these characteristics for yourself can be kind of hard to articulate. And so I would like to invite all students here, faculty, I hope you're okay with this. I'm sure you are, but I'd like to invite all students here, speak with your faculty. If you're having a hard time, for example, defining for yourself how you fulfill leadership criteria or leadership roles, talk to a faculty member who knows you well, and I'm sure they'll be able to tell you. Our career counselors also love working with students on this. We love getting to know you and helping you highlight those strengths and skills. Um, I know a lot of students um, tend to think, well, if I can do it, it's no big deal, but that's, that's wrong. It's a big deal. So when we think about things like career and self-development, that's simply looking at, do you know where you wanna be in five years? Do you know what your goals are? Do you know how those goals um, how you're working toward those goals. Are you aware of your strengths and of the areas that you need to improve on? Um, critical thinking, of course, is problem solving, and we've all done that, um, especially over these past two years, right? Just navigating this pandemic and all of the other things we've had to get around. Critical thinking is, is critical. Um, leadership skills, you don't have to be an elected officer in your student organization to be a leader. You can be a leader simply if you're working on a group project in class, right? Or maybe in your volunteer areas, maybe you've set up some volunteer work. There's a lot of different ways that we can demonstrate leadership. Teamwork, we understand. Technology, we've already talked at length today about how important that is to be able to talk about that. Don't assume that employers know all of the great things. Um, I got really excited because I think it was Ms. Harvin mentioned um, uh, Prezi, and I'm like, yes, because that is something I'm not using it today, but that's one of our favorite tools in career services. And I'm currently interviewing for career counselors and somebody said they use Prezi and they demonstrated it for us. And I was so excited about that. So think about the things that you just do naturally that you're like, ah, it's no big deal. It's a big deal. So we have to be sure that we're talking about those things in the interview. Um, also, a few other things on this slide, equity and inclusion. Employers now more than ever are looking for people who are really committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. And so if you can talk about how you've been engaged in those kinds of efforts, how you have actively sought out ways to learn um, and engage with people from cultures or backgrounds different than your own, those are good things to talk about. And professionalism, I'm going to talk about professional image in a few minutes, but professionalism is more than an image. It's more than what you wear. It's more than what color your hair is, whether or not you have tattoos. That's not professionalism. Professionalism are the bit that's really it comes down to the behaviors that you express in the workplace. Are you courteous to your coworkers? Do you show up on time for things? When someone emails you, do you email back in a timely way? So all of these things, um, they're behaviors that we need to exhibit. And as you're a student at Central Piedmont, hopefully these are things you're already doing. 
right? You've already got this under control. And so um, these, again, these eight competency areas, I, I challenge everyone who's here today to think about and come up with a few specific examples of how you've demonstrated that because this will serve you well. Employers are looking for it and will serve you well to talk about this in your future job interviews. Now, how do you know what an employer is looking for? So we talked about the eight competency areas, but where do you research? How do you find out? Um, and so I loved it that um, our two former students today talked about their workplaces. Um, and so, yeah, reach out to the people that you know, right? Reach out to your faculty members. One of the great things about a lot of the faculty who work here at Central Piedmont is that they're in industry still. They're teaching classes, but they're also really well connected with industry. Um, but go to the company website. Look up the company online, Google them, make sure you click on the news link when you look at Google um, to see if they've been in the news recently for anything that you should know about. LinkedIn is also a great resource um, and Glassdoor.com, of course. Um, if you're not familiar with Glassdoor, it's where people can go in and re write reviews of their employers. Um, and so it can give you a little bit of a better insight into the workplace. Okay, so once you've done all of your prep work and you've learned about what they want, you've defined what you've got going for you, how do you practice? So a few things are important to practice. Um, every interview is going to begin with some version of the question, tell me about yourself, why should I hire you? Why did you want, you know, why did you want to become this particular job title? Every interview just kind of starts off that way. So it's a good idea. We, we explain or we advise people to prepare something called an elevator pitch that just explains who you are professionally and how you got here. Um, be able to answer common interview questions. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses and places I need to improve? Behavioral questions. And also always at the end of an interview, you're going to be asked, do you have any questions for me? Do you have any questions for us? And you always should have questions. Um, and so at the end of the slides, there's going to be a link for the career guide, which is going to list general questions, behavioral questions, even gives you some ideas on questions you should ask. Um, but I'd also like to introduce you to a tool called Big Interview, which is a virtual mock interview software platform that our department um, recently adopted. It allows you to go in and narrow down questions, interview questions by your industry. You have the option, um, basically when you get started, you'll fill out a short profile. And then when you get started with the program um, and select your interview questions, a little window will pop up. There'll be a person there who asks a question and then you can record your response. And you can play around with that and record as many times um, as you need to, to really one, practice answering, but two, make sure that you're answering and just really nailing that question. It also allows you to prepare your elevator pitch, and they had a lot, a lot of great lessons about um, just interviewing and job search in general. Um, and it's a great way, actually, you can record your interview questions and share them with others to get feedback or just share them for future reference. Sometimes when I'm doing a mock interview session, I'm like, I'll think to myself, oh, I nailed that. That was awesome. It's great that it's recorded and I can come back and look at it later when I can't remember exactly what I said, right? So this is another great thing about the system and it is available to all of Central Piedmont students. Um, so if you haven't checked it out yet, please do. All right, I said I was gonna talk a little bit about professional image. So let's just start off with the obvious, what do you wear to an interview? <laughs> um, I will say a lot of interviews are happening virtually now. So um, in the past, we tell you, you know, you wanna wear a jacket and pants, you know, a suit if possible, um, close toed shoes, you know, wear a tie. If, if you are wearing, you know, an outfit that lends itself well to a tie, wear conservative colors. However, since a lot of us are interviewing now through Zoom, um, same rules kind of apply. Keep in mind at some point, and this has happened in interviews where you might have to get up and walk away from the camera. So um, I've heard people joke, I can wear my pajama pants, right? Suit on top, pajama pants on bottom. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> um, but you still want to dress up, keep the colors rather neutral. I would actually um, maybe do a test run, make sure the lighting in your room is right so that you're not wearing anything that contrasts too wildly with the lighting. Um, but the main key is for this piece is you want your focus to be on the content of your answers and your qualifications, not your image. So, um, or not on your clothes or your accessories. So that's the main thing that's important here. Um, and we have included a link at the end of this um, that will give you kind of a breakdown on business, business casual, all the different types of, of clothing to wear. 
Um, and I also um, recommend, again, if you've got an outfit, if you've got a big interview coming up and you're like, how does my outfit look? Reach out to one of your faculty members. I'm sure they would love to do a little fashion check with you. We in Career Services love to do that kind of thing too. So please reach out to us. The last thing I'm gonna say about clothing is that um, sometimes people think they, the more expensive the suit, the better off they are. And I'm going to say, I know when I was in college that was not always an option. Nobody knows where you got that suit at or that jacket or that dress. Nobody knows where you got that but you. So utilize thrift stores if you have to borrow clothing from other people as long as it fits well. Um, the main thing is, is that you feel like you look good and you're confident. All right, this is the other piece of professional image. It's not just what you look like. Um, it's also how you present yourself um, through different methods of communication. So if you're calling an employer or they're calling you about an interview, um, whenever you return calls, make sure you do it within one business day. Make sure that you're leaving your full name when you leave a voicemail and make sure that you know that you're actually explaining what the, the voicemail is about, right? So um, don't let it be too long. Don't let it be too rambling and always include your return phone number. I think that's the biggest mistake sometimes that people make. Um, I've done it too. I, I'll admit, I, you know, if it's a big phone call, sometimes I'm like, oh, and I'll call back and say, here's my number. Um, but always make sure full name, phone number, and a brief statement about what you're calling about. Your email should include a clear subject line. Make sure you grammar and spell check everything. Um, do not trust autocorrect. Autocorrect is not your friend. Um, so make sure you are just being really careful and meticulous with all of your, um, all of your communications. Avoid emojis. I love a good smiley here and there. Those of you who email with me on a regular basis know this. I'm sorry, I'm working on it, but avoid that when you're um, emailing with a potential employer um, and make sure that you're being careful about capitalization. So, and then finally, another way that we communicate confidence and we communicate professionalism is by, you know, carrying ourselves upright, carrying ourselves well. It's easy and as we're all hunched over computers these days, it's easy to get hunched over, but Shoulders back, posture as straight as you can get it, um, keeping an open posture, so no closed arms, no you know, tightening down, keeping that camera on, smiling, um, and remember that this is how we, we communicate to others that we are open and that we are ready to receive. Okay, and finally, after the interview, so you've done a really good job of communicating, you've done a great job of expressing your interest and in articulating your strengths and skills, um, everything looks great, the last piece is to follow up with an email. And so what happens oftentimes is people get through the interview and they're like, okay, relief, we're done, I can breathe again. But the thing is, is that that email um, should always be sent. Make sure that you send it if it's a hiring committee or a panel you're meeting with, make sure you customize that email to each person in that panel. Make sure you send it to the right person in the panel. Um, make sure you're spelling the panel's members' names right. <laughs> so I think that's a big one. I have a name. Um, it's an easy last name, but it can be tricky. Everyone wants to put an I in my last name. Um, and so, and I'll tell you, I don't get offended at it, but I do notice when people misspell my name. Um, but in that follow-up email, make sure that you are, again, just offering gratitude for the chance to talk to them and learn a little bit more about the position. Offer any additional information and maybe anything that you missed or anything, you know, um, I interviewed a candidate not too long ago who forgot something in the interview. She just had one of those moments where she blanked and she said it and it was fine. And in her follow up email to me, she said, hey, that thing I blanked on here it is just wanted you to know. And I really appreciated that she took the time to follow up and just I, I knew what she was talking about and it was fine. But I thought it was great that she followed up with that. So that follow up resume or follow up emails. Anything that you missed, right? Um, and anything that you want to reiterate. Um, and so if the hiring manager talked about a project and you know that you'd be great on that project, tell them why in that follow up email. Um, but that piece kind of closes the, the loop on the communication and really does show that you can be a great professional candidate for that job. So on this screen, um, I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions, but on this screen, I have a link to our career guide, which is an online pamphlet or booklet that gives a ton of great sample interview questions, sample resumes, tips on how to do job shadowing. Somebody mentioned job shadowing, job shadowing and, and interviewing, informational interviewing before, and this will give you a breakdown on how to do that. 
Um, also, the launch your job search is a quick kind of rundown um, basic job search tips, um, but also breaks down. I know clothing categories are confusing for a lot of people. I'm going to be honest, it's even confusing for us at this point now that everybody's working from home or at work and, you know, sweatpants are a thing, but they're not. I don't know. We're all working it out, but this will talk to you a little bit about the traditional clothing kind of categories so that you have a better better understanding maybe of what kind of outfits to put together, um, not only for interviews, but also, also for the job. Um, but thank you everyone for your time. Um, just again, wanted to ask if anyone has any questions. Just recognize that I don't have the chat box open. So let me see if I can open that. There, I'll help you out. Uh, okay. There is a question in there and it says, do you have any tips to ease anxiety before an interview? Oh, me too. Me too. Um, I'm just, and you know what? I like to think of it this way. Um, if you weren't anxious about it, it would mean that you didn't care, right? We get anxious. Anxious is actually a survival mechanism. And I know when you're in the middle of an anxiety kind of episode, it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel great, but it's your body's way of saying, I'm going to keep you safe, right? And so when I feel anxiety myself, I think, uh, there's something I'm nervous about. There's something I'm worried about, right? And so I think that's the first step. I'm saying this as a counselor. <laughs> it's the first step is to recognize nothing is wrong. You're okay. Anxiety is a, is a, is a natural reaction. That said, I'm going to acknowledge it doesn't feel good and it's hard to concentrate. And so what I would recommend for many people taking some deep breaths, um, we have an exercise that I, I like to use a lot. It's called the calm technique. It's kind of a progressive relaxation exercise. And I can email that. Um, I'll email these slides out to you, um, Marsha, if that's okay, and I'll email the calm exercise as well if anybody wants to use it. But I would say that if you um, have severe anxiety or anxiety, or let me define it as anxiety that you feel is going to impact your ability to interview well, make an appointment with a career counselor. We can talk to you in a confidential setting and give you some techniques. After talking to you a little bit and learning a little bit more about what's going on, we can help you come up with some strategies that will work well for you. But I just wanted to say, I just wanted to normalize, like the anxiety piece, a lot of people suffer from that. There is nothing wrong um, with having anxiety, but again, acknowledging it doesn't feel good. It makes it hard to function. So we want to address that. So our counselors are trained to work with people who are having those kinds of issues and we'll be happy to help. Um, and to make an appointment, if you go to the career services website, there's going to be a link right at the top of the page that'll allow you to request an appointment. Um, and you can click that link, fill out some information, and one of our counselors will get back to you. Um, it's usually within a few hours at the very most one business day. Um, and so just check your email for that response and we'll, we'll get you on our calendars. But thank you for that question. Oh, I hope, I hope you do. <laughs> I would love to work with you on that. Um, any other questions? This is Lou Banks, the former student. I don't have a question, but I wanted to say that you were talking about sending the email out. It is very important that even if you interview internally within your company, still send the email. Yes, yes, thank you. Job. Thank you for saying that. And thank you for pointing out internal interviews for anyone who is fortunate enough to get an internal interview. Treat that internal interview as if you were an external candidate. I think the biggest mistake people make sometimes with those internal interviews is they're too relaxed and casual about them. And so, and keep in mind, you working for an organization, that's one of your biggest strengths and one of the biggest things you've got going for you over all of the external candidates. So make sure that you emphasize the changes that you've made and, and thank you so much for bringing that up about the, um, I'm gonna make a note to start including a bit about internal interviews um, on, my, on my slides. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, but yeah, are those thank you notes, it sounds like you've gotten a few thank you notes before, Lou. I have. I send one every time I interview within my company and I dress just like if I had was not working for the company. Good, good, good. I, and I think, you know, that, that is, that's how it's done. Um, and so a lot of what we do with interviewing is it's common sense. It's presenting ourselves as a good candidate and it's also sort of understanding the etiquette. Right and, and sort of adhering to the etiquette. So, um, thank you for sharing that. Any other questions or comments? Uh, 
Okay, and hearing none, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I can get back to that. Okay, um, and just wanted to thank everyone. And again, I will send these slides along along with that little um, the column exercise. I'll send that over to you, Marcia, to be shared with the faculty. So thank you. And uh, Christy, as as uh, I'm going to pull up one um, one thing to put on the screen, but there is another question. So if you don't mind answering this one while I pull this up, um, do employers care about gaps in your resume? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> Yes and no. So the last few years have been very interesting for our workforce. We've had a lot of people transition out of the workforce. We've had people, you know, have to, to stay home either due to illness or to be a caregiver for someone or, you know, there have been layoffs. There's just been a lot going on. So what I would say to anyone who is currently experiencing gaps in their resume, but is also currently going to school, there's technically no gap in your resume. You're going to school. Um, the other thing I would say is that it is okay. Um, your business is your business. I, I want to make sure I say this correctly. Your business is your business. And if you get asked a question like that in a job interview, um, do not feel that you have to give every single detail about what went down. It could just be that you were looking for new opportunities. So you decided to come to central Piedmont to take some classes. You don't have to say anything else if there was something else going on that made it, you know, necessary for you to decide to go to CP. Like, there's just so many different things. I'm just going to say your business is your business. Um, and this is a good reason. Um, you've got a lot of resources on this call right now between your faculty, who I'm sure would be happy to talk to you about how to answer this question um, to us in career services. It, I've had people call me and ask, you know, Christy, here's my situation. What should I say? I have one student I'm in constant contact with who for a period of several months where she was interviewing, she would email me after every interview and say, this is what I said. What do you think? Um, this is why we're here. We're here to support and here to help. And um, so, yeah, long answer to a short question. Do employers care? Maybe some, but there's a lot of different reasons people could have gaps right now. And the more I'm hearing from HR and maybe um, Mr. Zeitlo can weigh in on this, but the more I'm hearing from HR is, they're not liking to ask that question so much anymore. So, but yeah, for sure, for, for sure, Christy, I think, uh, and everybody's individually um, has an individual story, right? So mm -hmm. it is really important to talk to somebody you trust and kind of go through it, ask the question, answer the question, know what you want to say, know what you don't want to say. But I'd say the market is such right now, you have no head there. The uh, market, uh, is such right now that um, really what they're looking for is a qualified employee. So the key there is to bring it around to your qualifications. Thank you, I agree. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, uh, Mr. Zeitlow for um, your comments as well. And we we have a final question in the chat, but I'm, I'm not actually gonna answer the question. Um, the question is describe the topic of this business student leadership series workshop and how does the topic connect to today's business environment? And both of those questions were answered throughout the session. So I encourage you, um, if you missed a portion of the session, I encourage you to go back and take a look at it and you will find your answer to that question. So. Thanks for asking, but um, yeah, I'm not going to answer that one. Final thing is uh, just before we close out, I want to share for next month. Um, if you'll take a look at, well, of course you're looking at your screen. Um, next month, the month of February, is National Career and Technical Education Month. Um, Career and technical education, those for the programs that are in our area, all of these business programs, all two year programs generally are going to be career and technical education if those degrees prepare you to go into the workforce. So today you heard about office administration, medical office administration, billing and coding. After you um, are awarded that degree, you can go directly into the workforce. So that is a career and technical education. So next month we will be celebrating that. We will um, celebrate during the month of February 13th or the week of February 13th through 19th, FBLA PBL week. 
So we are celebrating all business and accounting professions. And then on Friday, February 18th, we invite you to come take part in our mock interview workshops. Christy gave you some really, really great information today about interviewing. And so we challenge you to sign up for one of the interview slots and allow, um, allow us to interview you or some of our business professionals. They will be volunteering their time. So come interview and just practice those interview skills, get feedback. We invite you to do that next month with us. So we will not have a Wednesday session, but next month's session will be on Friday, February 18th, mock interview workshops. And all of your instructors will be posting information about the workshops. We'll be sending out the invitation for you to sign up for a time slot. So we wanted to, uh, to share that with you today. And with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to Dr. Martin to close us out. Thank you, Ms. Colson. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us this afternoon. Um, I hope um, you learned some valuable information about our programs and as well as hearing from our students today. And thank you, uh, Ms. Colson, for allowing us to present this afternoon, um, as well as thank you to um, Ms. Harvin and Ms. Brunson for um, being the best colleagues that anyone could ask for. So I appreciate y'all's support, not just in today's presentation, but throughout uh, the year. So thank you all for coming and have a good afternoon. <laughs>